full disclaimer, a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about today are things that have been studied in rodent models and have been studied in vitro and cultured cells. But this is interesting stuff. And when you're looking at the world of biohacking, you have to be able to sort of look ahead a little bit. If we always wait for evidence to come out in humans, we'd obviously be late to the game. So although we don't take this stuff 100% to the bank and take it as literal fact, we can still look at these rodent model studies and extrapolate very interesting potential mechanisms to see why this might be something interesting. So today we're talking about spermidine. Spermidine is a specific kind of what is called a polyamine. Okay, so polyamines are groups of aminos. Okay, they're very specific groups of aminos that may have free radical neutralizing capabilities, they may have anti-inflammatory capabilities, they may have gene expression capabilities, they do very interesting things. And spermidine has been really under the microscope, no pun intended, a lot recently because we've been starting to see it in the longevity communities as something that's a very powerful antioxidant. So let's break down how it might work within the body. Now, before you think that this is something that's just randomly created in a lab, spermidine is something that you can still get extracted from, like grapefruit, from teas, from broccoli. You're just not getting it in a very concentrated form. So spermidine, as far as a supplement is concerned, is more of a synthetic form of it. And you can obviously get a lot higher concentrations of it. But I wanna focus mainly on the neuroprotective side. Okay, so spermidine as a neuroprotectant is where the bulk of the research really lands. And I wanna talk about an initial study that looked at it in mice and how it really did offer some interesting neuroprotective effects. So the study was published in the journal Biogerontology and it took a look at aging-induced rats. So these were rats that they artificially made them get older, essentially, right? And what they did is they gave them 10 milligrams of spermidine per kilogram of body weight. Now that's a hefty dose, but the results were pretty interesting. They found that there was a decrease in pro-oxidants within the brain. So these are things that would typically cause oxidative stress with a simultaneous increase in antioxidants within the brain. Okay, so something is happening at a level that is upregulating sort of our endogenous production of antioxidants and downregulating, decreasing oxidative stressors within the brain. Now, specifically, they saw an increase in something that's called ATG3. Now, ATGs are autophagy related proteins. So they're related to sort of the cellular recycling. Now, there's different categories of these proteins, and it gets very complex very quick. So in a very colloquial sense, like what they do is they basically help cellular cleanup work a little bit more efficiently. What's interesting is they also saw an increase in ULK1, which is associated with this as well, and a decrease in interleukin-6, so a decrease in neuroinflammation. But they saw this mainly in the aging mice, not in the other mice, which implies that there could be somewhat of a selective ability for spermidine to affect an aging brain in a positive way which is very, very interesting. Obviously, we need more research to understand this. So then we kind of lead into the next category of it being a neuroprotectant, which is the neuroinflammation side. As a matter of fact, there was a study literally published in the journal Neuroinflammation that took a look at what is called the beta amyloid pathway. Now, you've probably heard of beta amyloid plaque before because it's talked about a lot in the neurodegenerative disease community. It's like it's uh, Alzheimer's, things like that. And over the last couple of years, it's gotten a little bit more scrutiny because we're starting to understand that maybe Alzheimer's isn't only associated with beta amyloid plaque. That being said, these different beta amyloid proteins, these AB40s, AB42, things like that, these are still problematic because they can still trigger inflammation. So what this research set out to do was see if spermidine could play a role in beta amyloid plaque sort of breaking down. So they took a look at mice that were essentially they induced neurodegeneration to the point where they were, uh, had Alzheimer's. Okay, so they had, took Alzheimer's mice compared to what are called wild type mice that were healthy. Okay, and they gave them dissolved spermidine in their water. So they were sipping on it continuously. And they looked at these mice when they were 30 days old, 120 days old, and 290 days old. So what's interesting is that at 120 days and 290 days, mice ended up seeing a reduction of what is called AB40 specific amyloid, a beta amyloid. Okay, now this ended up being reduced 40%. Now what's really interesting is that a different type of beta amyloid that was AB42, this decreased 49% 
in 290 day mice. In case you haven't fallen asleep and you're still watching this video with all this, what this means is that somehow spermidine is having an effect at reducing these beta amyloids that can lead to what is called beta amyloid plaque. You've probably heard of beta amyloid plaque before because it's talked about all the time, but people oftentimes that are talking about it don't really know what's going on. So beta amyloid plaque leads to these neurofibrillary tangles. Okay, so these tangles that occur within our brain. And these tangles are ultimately leading to increased levels of inflammation. This is where things get kind of confusing with Alzheimer's because we don't always know what is causing the inflammation. Is it the disease itself? Is it the tangles? The bottom line is that it seems to break down some of these tangles so that there's less inflammation. But we can't say that for certainty in a human model. We see it in rodents, but I'm very careful not to say that it's going to magically do this in humans. Now, another way that spermidine could be affecting the brain is you have an influx of calcium in the neurons. And when this happens in an aging brain, it can cause the neurons to die. And for a multitude of potential reasons, spermidine might be kind of reducing the calcium influx into the neurons. So there's a couple proposed mechanisms, but again, we still need to flush it out with more research. Now it's worth noting that luteolin has very powerful effects here as well. So if you're looking at potentially experimenting with this stuff, spermidine and luteolin are both very powerful in the research when it comes down to the in vitro stuff and the rodent model stuff. I popped a link down below for a company called Verso that has a product called Clean Being, which has spermidine, has luteolin, it has what is called dihydroquercetin. So kind of a triple punch effect when you're looking at these potential things. The whole idea behind Verso Clean Being is to help with the cleanup processes within the body. So we've got autophagy, which is sort of the cellular recycling that's occurring. We've got apoptosis, which is like the pre-programmed cellular death. We of course have the inflammatory pathways there. So the combination of those three might work very, very, very well there. Now again, this is for people that are interested in kind of experimenting with this stuff and trying it out. So I popped the link down below that'll save you 15% off through Verso if you do want to check them out. Again, the product is called Clean Being. So it's a mix of spermidine, luteolin, and dihydroquercetin, which I've talked about in other videos. Just a more bioavailable form of quercetin, which may be playing a really powerful role as a potential anti-inflammatory. So again, that link is down below, check them out. So we're 15% off right below this video in the top line of the description. Now let's jump over to the longevity piece for a second. Okay, there was a study published in the journal Nature Medicine that was taking a look at spermidine and its effect on potential longevity. And again, we get into rodent model studies, but still very interesting. So with this study, they gave mice various polyamines in their water and some just get straight water. The mice that ended up sipping on spermidine for their entire life ended up living longer. Now, I'm not suggesting that you take spermidine for the rest of your life, right? This is a rodent model study and it's just, it paints a picture. When they have a continuous sort of flow of it, there's interesting things happening. They also confirmed this by checking the bioavailability of spermidine in the mice themselves. So if they've been sipping on a various polyamine or spermidine for their entire life, and then they check the actual bioavailable levels in the mice themselves, they can cross-reference and say, okay, yes, there are higher amounts of spermidine in this mouse. The potential reason, or at least speculated reason, is autophagy. Okay, again, they see increases in these autophagy-related proteins, in this case, ATG7. Now, what this means from an autophagy perspective, remember, autophagy is all about cellular recycling, so taking just components of cells or organelles that are not really being used anymore and recycling them either for themselves or to ultimately be excreted, right? Now, if you have more autophagy-related proteins like ATG7, ATG3, it means that you can form what is called an autophagosome. An autophagosome is what engulfs the pathogen or what engulfs the bad material. Without the autophagosome, there's nothing to actually like, it's like a net, nothing else to engulf it. So in mice, when you see these ATG3, ATG7 increase, it's a very positive buy sign. Now, the way that they've sort of confirmed this was with a study published in Nature Cell Biology. Now, this particular study was done with flies and some particular human immune cells. So it's a little bit far-fetched, but it is what it is when it comes down to looking at this data. So we saw increases in ATG7, but also increases in what is called Becklin-1, both associated with autophagy. Especially when you look at human immune cells, it's very interesting because what we don't realize is that autophagy plays a role in engulfing pathogenic material too. 
So autophagy and the immune system do actually work more hand in hand than they're given credit for in the mainstream. So with this, spermidine and these other polyamines and things like luteolin that are just powerful free radical scavengers, or at least things that upregulate free radical scavenging within our body, are playing a much bigger role than what we see on the surface. It's not like taking in vitamin C that's neutralizing bad things. There's something deeper going on that's actually potentially helping autophagy and helping these other processes that allow us sort of endogenously to be better at staving off these free radicals to live a better, healthier life. So again, it's all research, but in the world of biohacking, it's what it's all about. I'll see you tomorrow.